Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, your watch is correct, your iPhone's correct. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. These things drive us, it informs us, it inspires us, and just whatever happens. These are fun, free-flowing conversations. Long overdue, so excited about my guest today. Today's guest is an American rock drummer, breast cancer survivor, and founder of Breast Cancer Can Stick It. It's a foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. And since 2010, April and this organization have raised over $600,000 for the fight against breast cancer. She's also the author of a brand new book, Breast Cancer Can Stick It. I'm talking about my friend, my guest, April Samuels. What's up, April? What's up, man? Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. Well, it's a bleed some timpani. (laughs) You know, (laughs) live from Dallas, Texas and Nashville. Where are you in the... I love Dallas. I mean... I really do. Where are you in the, what's your, uh, borough? I, I'm on the North side of Dallas. Um, and I actually grew up in Plano. So yeah. that's kind of, you know, the area that I'm located North of Dallas. Plano was kind of a, like the Beverly Hills for a while. And now it's Frisco, right? Yep. Totally. hundred percent, man. And then tonight is the ACM awards in Dallas. And I'm usually there, but, um, my band said, we don't need you. We don't want drums on this song. <laughs> we- what? We've got a banjo. We don't need drums. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I won't be there tonight. They're they're doing a special performance, but you'll have to watch the show um, to to see what's going on. But how about this book? I was asking you off camera. This is a thick book. It's a not a paperback. This is a real hardback coffee table book, which means the publisher absolutely loves you, absolutely believes in you. What's happening? Are you getting preferential treatment at restaurants? <laughs> Not yet, man. Not yet. I'm sure it'll come soon, right? Yes. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> so, so we we had a uh, an event a couple weeks back. It was like a pre-launch event to kind right. of celebrate the book and the some early investors and some people that were special and along the way. And then you had an official couple of days later. You had an official launch party. Yeah. So tell us about both those things. Man, the VIP release was at the Sanctuary in McKinney, Texas. So incredible having all those folks that supported the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter raised $15,000, so it it actually met and exceeded the goal um, to be able to release the book. So that was awesome back in January. So those top investors, like you were saying, were invited to this VIP party uh, at an intimate event where we had people read from the book. We had Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy there, who's like a an expert in the field of breast oncology. Um, and it was just a really cool, intimate event. And we had you there because you're super cool. And then we had John Kelly from Quiet Riot, Danzig, Typo Negative, Lori Peters from Skillet, and Pete Coatney from uh, Jack Ingram. And so it was just really cool to have everybody there supporting and celebrating that moment like a week before the actual release. So it was a really blessed event. And your dad was there. He's funny. Yeah, yeah, he's awesome. My dad is the greatest. I'm super blessed with uh, amazing parents and my dad is is the best. He actually wrote uh, one of the letters in the front of the book too. So he he got up and read some of that. But then a week later, we did this big show over at uh, Lava Cantina in the Colony. And we had my band, the Breast Cancer Can Sick It Band, my other band, Rebel Yell, which is a tribute to Billy Idol. And then Just Like Pink, which is a tribute to Pink, who I play. I'm like their tour drummer, as they call it. So anytime they play out of state, I play with Just Like Pink. And so, uh, yeah, it was a busy night. Mark Schulman was there from Pink, uh, also from Billy Idol. And I wrote the forward. And he wrote the forward. Totally cool. And we had a fabulous turnout just feel so so grateful and and blessed to have had such a wonderful turnout and sell a lot of books too well I, you know and you took a tragedy and you turned into into triumph um share with us a little bit i had the specific date here when you were diagnosed but you could probably do a better job than me oh yeah that's one of those things you, you'd never forget right um yeah it was at nine o'clock a tuesday morning um wow. it was uh october the 26th uh, 2010. And my phone rang. Actually, I'll put it to you this way. The day before that, my phone rang and I had had two biopsies done. 
Um, one was an aspiration and one was a core needle biopsy. If you're not familiar with the difference, aspirations are usually for like a liquid filled cyst of some kind. And then a core needle biopsy is more for something solid. So um, the day before I was diagnosed, I got the call from the doctor and they were like, hey, we got your results back. Everything's great. I'm like, oh, cool. Awesome. So both the biopsies are good. And she's like, oh, no, this is just the aspiration. And I was like, oh, my God. OK, you know, but. To be honest, I wasn't that worried about it because I'd had biopsies and aspirations in, in, in the past and everything turned out fine. Yeah. But still, it was a little bit, you know, maybe a little anxious. So then the next morning, uh, the actual doctor called me and uh, I remember that he said, you have uh, triple negative breast cancer. It's high grade. He said, uh, be sure you get on some rep reputable websites and, and learn a little bit about it and um, want you to come in so we could talk about it some more. And he said other stuff, but like I always say, he uh, his voice kind of morphed into it like Charlie Brown's T-shirt. Yeah, it was yeah. just like it was like wah, wah, wah. I just yeah, I was gone because I was like, what you know, a diagnosis like that. It's a uh, really hard to describe what that feels like because I mean, you literally think um, you're gonna die and you feel like it's soon. You know, yeah, it's very scary. But you uh, you you navigated this and. It's all in the book. I mean, some people get a little surfacey on their. This is look at how thick this book. This is, <laughs> this is warts and all, almost like a. Joke. It is. It's yeah. like almost like a day by day approach. To yeah, it really was. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what it was, man. Is it's it's like I was doing blogs and stuff uh, during like immediately after I was diagnosed. It was kind of ended up being really therapeutic to to write down my feelings and thoughts uh, just about every day um, after I was diagnosed and what happened was like all these people just started saying you should turn this into a book and like i'd never thought of that like i just never thought of that in a million years i, I didn't really ever read that much i was just like I, I was like yeah whatever whatever but it happened so much that it got to a point where i was like i i feel like i can't ignore this this is a sign this is something that i'm supposed to do um and yeah it only took me <laughs> you know 10 years 12 14 whatever it's, been. it's a long process right and, God, man. and and you've been a little bit busy because you're playing drums in a million bands yeah um you've had booking agencies you might still have a booking agency you're you know you're doing all this double double triple duty playing in this very robust music scene that is dallas we i love the music scene there and you have this also more organization this nonprofit, and each year to raise money for research uh you have the drumathon yep. and your this year is your 10th and let's just plug it here i have it here somewhere it's going to be you're the best man <laughs> it is going to be at the colony in north dallas when october 20th this year 12 p.m to 7 p.m and there's going to be celebrity rock star drummers live musical guests family and friends there, there might be some food giveaways everybody gets to play the drums and the money is that's being raised is all for an amazing cause that's uh october 20th it's saturday right sunday it's a sunday it's sunday a october the 20th this year 12 p.m to 7 p.m at the grandscape is that like a a venue or is it an outdoor venue it's an outdoor venue it's a, like an entertainment district um lots of shops and restaurants and things they've got a big lawn a giant stage with a huge led screen it's a perfect home for uh drumathon every year where was but, the very first one you know i don't know if you knew this the first drumathon we ever had was in a small town it's kind of sandwiched between alan mckinney and and lucas and it's called Fairview, Texas. Fairview, um, Texas. And they have this like outdoor mall and they had a stage on the backside. And I was like, let's have it there. And so uh, we threw it there. And man, I'm telling you what, you learn everything you need to know after you have w the first event. Like you learn it all. It's like falling down the stairs. And then as soon as you're done with that, it's great. From that point forward, like we learned all of our, you know, had all of our mistakes and everything. But, you know, we had Carmen Apice, Vinnie Apice, and Matt Starr that first year. And yeah. uh, Dan Schinder from Drum Talk TV actually came down and emceed the event. And, I mean, you know, it was a great start. We raised $13,000 that first year. And, I mean, we'd never done it before. So I was pretty proud of how that turned out. But then yeah. when you came was the second year. Um, and it was 2016, and that was at Clyde Warren Park in downtown Dallas. And uh, it was you, uh, Carmody Peace, Mark Schulman, and Matt Starr. And um, 
It was, it was like, like eight years ago. Like, How is this? I know. I don't know, man. <laughs> I almost don't I mean, like to talk about that part. <laughs> and then COVID just ate two years of our lives there. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the celebrity drummers that stopped by, it's insane. Over the years, you've had Aaron Spears. You've had Chad Gracie from Alive. Um, Kathy Rich, uh, Buddy's uh, daughter. Gina Shock from the Go-Go's. Uh, Bissonette from David Lee Roth. Hannah Welton from Prince. You got the Johnny Kelly. We love him. Keo from Big and Rich. Our yep. pal Lori Peters, Nate Morton from The Voice, Ricky Rocket. I mean, you got a deep Rolodex. Um, I love it that you when you when you could get to a certain point in your life where you could send crazy memes to some of your childhood heroes, right? And, <laughs> I know, you know, right? I mean, when I got to introduce Carmine, Carmine um, Apice, Vinny Apice, Carmine, Carmine yeah, Apice. When I got to introduce Carmine on the microphone, I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy. I'm introducing one of my childhood heroes and we're right. all just sitting here breaking bread and it's for an amazing cause. And we all get to play. Now, what the format of Drumathon is very unique. It's like a fundraiser. So people go almost like it, it's almost like they can go door to door to raise money if they want. And then whoever raises um, a sizable amount of money gets to get up and jam with the celebrity drummers. Yeah, it's actually um, so. I, I've never really told you how it came to be. It's pretty crazy. So there's a friend of mine who also grew up in Plano and they had a drumathon in the eighties. And so what they would do is literally, like you said, go door to door and ask people to sponsor them. But then they would play like a really long amount of time. So each person, they had just a few drummers that would play like an hour or two straight, just blah, over and over. Oh, God. And I was like, that sounds awful. <laughs> you know, that sounds, I'm a drummer and that sounds awful. <laughs> I know, so you, right? So you flipped it on its head and said, yeah, less, uh, more drummers, uh, less time. So that's exactly how we did it. And so essentially what happens is the top 25 fundraising drummers get to play a one minute solo on the stage and then they get half price on the play with a celebrity opportunity. So throughout the show, there's 30 minutes windows of time where each celebrity will play like a solo or some music. And then after that, people can get in line and pay to get up on a second drum set and jam alongside uh, you celebrities. And uh, it's just a really unique event. And I got the idea of that because I went to rock and roll fantasy camp right after I finished treatment in 2011. And I was like, this is like the coolest thing. You pay money and you get to jam with these rock stars. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, drummers aren't really out in the forefront enough. And um, being a drummer myself and tying it all together, it was really important to me, you know? Yeah. 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 No, it, it's an amazing format. And now after two and a half presidencies, you got a decade in time there. It is the format is locked in. It's growing in popularity. And I can imagine it does take a village. You've got committees, subcommittees. There's 300 volunteers that come and go and volunteer their time. How does it how does it work? How much time goes into actually planning that one day? Oh, my gosh. Well, we literally only take two months off a year uh, from working on Drumathon. November, so, December. Yep, that's right. Yeah. We take that off and uh, start back up in January. Uh, we usually start out with our committee meetings like once a month. Um, right now, we're already to every other week. And then as we get closer, it'll be once a week. Um, but yeah, like you said, you know, we started out um, just two years ago. We had like one board and three committees and now we have 10 committees and two boards and that's just in the last year and a half um so we're really growing by leaps and bounds and and getting more support from folks and volunteers and just to point out like you said you know we're 99 percent volunteer we pay one volunteer coordinator like 15 hours max per week so we're making sure that the bulk of the funds go towards the programs that we support, which are mammograms, research and trials, and financial assistance for breast cancer treatment. But yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a ten month a year thing, you know, like you've every year ten months working on it. It's crazy. Wow. It's yeah. incredible, and thank God you do it. I mean, so many people in my life are you know breast cancer. My mom survived breast cancers, breast cancer in the eighties, and you know she's. Hardy stock, man. She she beat that thing and um, ran the New York City Marathon. That's you beat awesome. that thing. You went to the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. You started a nonprofit. You play in a million bands. No one's going to. There's no mo, there's no moss growing on you. You're moving that ball <laughs> down the field every day. And you always have a big smile on your face. And you can always um, 
judge a person by their friends and you have some amazing friends in the industry so and uh, the book is fantastic everybody needs to get it it's a, it's a powerful read there it is breast breast cancer can stick it and you can get it on amazon right from jeff yep. bezos that's probably yep. the best best place to get it you can get it off of Amazon, uh, barnesandnoble.com also has it, or you can go to breastcancercanstickit.com and check it out there too. And then you have places. your .com, right? AprilSamuels.com. Yes. yes. I love it. And it seems to me that you're you're on sort of a junket. Uh, you have some nice appearances coming up. You're hitting the Music City Drum Show in Nashville. You're going to... Yep. Uh, you doing summer? you doing Summer Nam or... Uh, I'm not doing summer now, but we are doing Music City Drum Show there in Nashville in July for sure. We'll yeah. be doing Winter Nam in January. Winter um, Nam. But yeah, I mean, I have a lot of travel coming up through uh, Just Like Pink, the band I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're going to be in Colorado, Arizona, um, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana. Uh, next year is going to be Washington and Kentucky. And so I'm actually going to be piggybacking a lot of like book signings and uh, appearances that way um, because I'm like, hey, I'll be in town. You know, let's just pile it on. And I know you're familiar with that concept. <laughs> oh, my God. It's so easy because you could tell the person, hey, look it. I'm already here. Right. Right. You don't even have to cover that. I'm here. Even, I'm here. I yeah, am here. Exactly. Exactly. Well, th that is great. Um, yeah. Now, what is the Lynch? You have like a a lit metal shop. So yes. metal shop is you kind of hang your hat on that. You've been in that for a long time. Is that a perfect world entertainment band? Metal? It is. Yeah. Okay. Metal shop so, is perfect world. So you deal with um, my friends in Los Angeles. Ro yeah. Roger is is the guy. Uh, Roger, Jamie's yeah. part of the part Jamie, of the crew, yeah. too. But Roger's our guy. And uh, he manages the metal shop. Um, and as you know, there's a few metal shops across the country and we're the Dallas, you know, kind of Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana metal shop. And yeah, I've been with them for 12 years now. Yeah, it's great. Just month, it's, 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 it's just years. it's just working. And those those guys are really brilliant to do it because because metal shop was the impetus that inspired the creation of Steel Panther. Right. Yeah. Yes. The guys in Steel Panther were originally metal shop. Yeah. And then they split off and formed Still Panther. Exactly right, but it's the same concept: the, the spandex, the the choreo, uh, the guy liner, uh, the whole nine. So yeah. it's, it's really cool. Yeah. And your character is Crash Gordon. Crash Gordon, yes. I love it. So Perfect <laughs> World Entertainment also handles um, the spasmatics, and there's probably yep. like 15 spasmatics around oh, the country. God, yeah. And I helped start the one here in Nashville. I did it for maybe two years. It was fun because I got to play Roto Toms and stuff. And I had my little character, Ernest Winston Powell the Third, with the taped glasses awesome. and the high waters and everything. Yeah. It was really, really fun. It's a brilliant thing because people just, you know, a lot of at a lot of live music events, people just want to have fun. They want to reminisce. Yeah. They want to go down memory lane. And if you're playing White Snake, Guns N' Roses, and you have your tongue in your cheek a little bit, and you're like, yeah. wink, 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 it's a fun time. Oh, it's a blast, man. I have such a good time. I feel so fortunate ha to have landed that gig 12 years ago. I mean, it's it's everything really I ever wanted. I just I love to play. I want to play as much as I can. I like to travel. Um, all of it's cool. And the guys in the band were super close. You know, it's we have great chemistry. Um, we got this. We had a different guitar player when I started. And the guitar player we have now came on a year after I got with the band. So we've all been together now for 11 years um, nice. in this in this lineup. So we're very happy and we have a good time. We did the uh, Billy Idol after party on Tuesday night up at the Hard Rock Casino in Tulsa. Nice. And, um, you know, just fun stuff like that. It's, did, the, I mean, did, it's, the, did the band stop by? Eric uh, no, Aldenius and those guys? No, I did talk to him, but he yeah. wasn't able to stop by. So, yeah, you know, it's pretty pretty cool. Um, you know, get to see people. Last time we did it, uh, Winger was up there and, and Rod came by and, you know, watched us play a little bit. It's kind of weird because you can appreciate this. Uh, that venue requires that you play their backline electronic kit. Uh, I know it's rough, man. But, you know, I was really shocked at how well it sounded out front. And even Rod complimented that. So that was a, a big deal because, you know, you always are like, I don't know, man. But, yeah, it's very different, but it's still a lot of fun. I, sure. I really don't care. You could put some pillows out or, you know, some trash cans or something. I'd have a great time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, the thing about electronic drums is they, they and it's all the rage now in Nashville because we have these big corporate honky tonks like. Loretta Lynn's honky tonk and now Jason Aldean's and every all these country stars have their branded corporate three level honky tonks. And on a lot of them, 
there's a Roland drum set. And I'm like, oh, God. But <laughs> so I guess a gig like yours, you just go through the settings. You look for the you look for the metal patch or the right, big- well, they they actually are like, this is what you're going to use. And it's ah. it's set. And uh, I mean, the weird part is I have to be like, OK, dude, I need a I need a cowbell, though. You know, got to play some Rock of Ages, some Guns and Roses. So I need a cowbell. So then they have the cowbell on on the rim of the floor tub. So inevitably you're go, 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 go. Ah, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, you hit the rim. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, ah, uh. but uh, like I said, it, you know, I, I'm weird. I kind of, I kind of love doing different things. Like if I play on a, you know, a backline kit that's like a buddies or something, it's fun for me. It's just like, I don't know. I, I, I love all of it. It's a challenge. Um, it's yeah, a challenge. Yeah, yeah. It gives you something else to think about. And you're like, oh, I only have two symbols. I normally have, you know, four crashes or whatever it is. And you have yeah, to and do things different. And they're you know? cambers. And this is a CB 700 drum set from 1976. <laughs> and you're like, I'm hey, going to make it happen. Don't knock that, man. That was my first kit for real. Uh, CB 700? Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I bet some of that stuff sounds kind of quirky and fun if you can get your hands on it, really. Oh, yeah. No, uh, that was actually, yeah, the first kit I ever had. Uh, it's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> so your parents... Very, very supportive. I could just tell. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And, and just such sweet people. Um. Well, take us back. Um. To your drumming evolution. When did you start? Did you study with someone? What What was that all about? Who were your big influences? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So it started out. I had a, a best friend of mine. Her brother. Her older brother had a drum set. It was a silver cb 700 drum set actually and then my cousin also had a drum set so i was super young i was like five years old and i was exposed to drums in these two places and you know of course they wouldn't let me play them right no you can't play them and so it made me just really want to play them even more my <laughs> brother was taking uh guitar lessons at the time at a at a small uh music store that's still actually here in plano called music manor and um we went in there, mom and I, and my brother's in his lesson, and I found a pair of drumsticks, and I just pulled up my mom's dress. I'm like, mom, please buy me these drumsticks, you know? And she bought them for me, and I just was begging them for some kind of drum set forever. They finally got me like a toy, you know, paper sear drum set when I was about eight. Mm -hmm. And then at 11 years old, when I was still, you know, please, I want to play drums, they put me in drum lessons, so drum set lessons at that same store. Um, at the time, I was taking lessons from Warren White. He was with the Ice Capades. Yeah, Warren um, White, so, yeah. yeah. He, used to, he used to have like a, a very popular steel drum band in Dallas that worked a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he is a great guy. And, um, you know, uh, got me started like right into just like songs. You know, we didn't do a lot of rudiments and stuff. I mean, we had the stick control book, but we were kind of just working off the first couple of pages and really just jumping into learning music. And I remember um, him having me write out the music for My Kind of Lover by Billy Squire. And like I had to write out the whole thing and bring it in. I'm like, here's my homework, you know. And and so that was pretty cool. And uh, took from him for a while. Uh, then I started taking from a guy named John Mitchell. Um, and then, uh, I took from an, a woman for a short period of time, but then I just kind of broke out and I was like, I want a gig, you know? And so started gigging out when I was about 19. Um, and, uh, I didn't really go back to any lessons or, and didn't have any further formal training. Like I didn't do drums in school. It's so weird. Like for whatever reason, I didn't think that was cool, but I'd played trumpet in school. Like figure that one out for me. Cause I don't you played that. trumpet, but the drums are right there, but you're like, uh, well, you know what? <laughs> Bissonette played the trumpet, you know, it's good for you because to play a melodic instrument and see yeah. the note notes on the staff, you know. All yeah. That. Yeah. I was uh, I played trumpet and then I switched to French horn and I was like first chair of French horn. Oh, wow. And I remember I remember the teachers were always like, you know, hey, we, we want you to play drums. You know, we know you're a drummer. We want you to play drums. And I was just like, no, man, it's just not cool. <laughs> I don't know why. You didn't want to be, you know? you didn't want to be going, but a jump, bum, bum, jump, bum, bum. You wanted to go, I want, you know, yeah. I mean, for real, I did. And, um, and so I just never did it. I remember when I was in high school, like a junior and senior high school, um, seeing friends that were like in drum line and thinking, man, you know, I wish I would have kind of taking that path a little bit because that that looked like a lot of fun um but but i didn't and i did go to uh north texas for two and a half years uh got into the music program there 
I uh, did which, not be know honest, this. Yeah, which wait, to wait. be honest was crazy because I mean I just didn't have the schooling that everybody else did. So I was this around like nineteen eighty nine or so. Yeah, I, I think uh, my first year started the fall of eighty eight or eighty seven. Eighty seven. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so I went two and a half years there, and unfortunately, you know. Um, as a lot of people fall into and musicians and clubs and stuff like that. I, I got really into alcohol. And so I was drinking an awful lot and it was just, you know, making things not really possible. I wasn't able to keep up with school and all that stuff. And fortunately I dropped out of school and um, a few years later I, I quit drinking. I've been sober now since, uh, gosh, 91, 92, 92. Oh, good for yeah, you. Yeah. So, so you had years. like a three year run of like, leaving Las Vegas and like the film yes. and you're like, this is not sustainable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, I yeah. mean some, somewhere in, in the family, there was a, a, a gene. You're not wrong. It's weird that you said that. I can't even believe you said it. Um, but yeah, my dad's side of the family, they have uh, trouble with alcohol. My dad doesn't, but like his dad and other people on that side of the family. And he even told me, you know, when I started drinking, you know, he was like, you need to be careful. You know, in our family, there's a lot of alcoholics, you know, and uh, I just, I don't know, I just really fell hard into it. I uh, went through some, you know, really rough times and kind of hit bottom and uh, realized that I that I just wasn't a person who could drink. And wow. so I had I had to stop drinking. And, uh, you know, it's hard because being a musician, you know, you're exposed to it all the time. You know, you, you can't you can't stop drumming. You got to play the clubs and you're going to be around alcohol. So. I remember I quit drinking on December 27th and I kept my New Year's Eve plans and all my friends were partying and I just didn't. And I was like, "This I got to get used to this. I just got to get used so, to it. So you yeah. proved to yourself that you could do the first New Year's Eve like that. And then, of course, the it's one day at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and so now you're looking back. What was it? It's 30 years. 30, or something? Yeah. 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 It's, 32 years. Yeah. So does it ever get challenging or you're at a point where just like, hey, man, we're we're got some time in the trenches. This is not a problem. Man, there's always that temptation that I'm aware of, yeah. um, you know, especially if you're going through really difficult times, um, you know, uh, I any mean, kind of depression or, or loss or whatever, uh, it pops up, you know, it's just like, man, I could just go get drunk and lay in a corner somewhere, you know, not and, care and about so anything. When, you and know? so when that happens, do you call a trusted friend? Do you go to a meeting? What do you do? You know, I, I'm not stereotypical uh, in, in this regard at all. Um, I totally support all that stuff. It just it's just not the, the route I took. Um, you well, know, you didn't I do have, the program. No, I didn't do the program. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, I just I just made a commitment to myself and God and said, you know, this is I, I really honestly, Rich, I was just like, if I drink again, it means I don't want to live. That's what I told myself. Yeah. And I know I want to live. And so as long as I've got that going for me, you know, I'm 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 good to go. And um yeah. I don't see that ever changing, you know. I feel yeah. confident in it. But you know, it does suck to still have that, you know, it's like God, man, 32 years later and I can still remember what Corona and tequila taste like. Like I can like I could taste it like I can remember, you know, I'm like, <laughs> ah, was that that was like, your combination? Corona. Yeah. Tequila? I'd, yeah. I don't know why, but it was either, you know, I was either a night with Corona or a night with tequila and tequila anything like yeah. it didn't matter anything with tequila. In it. And it's funny because, uh, you know, I didn't really realize I had a problem. And then in retrospect, my my friends were like, yeah, you were always drinking and we weren't. And I was like, you mean you guys weren't drinking when we were just running to the mall? You know, <laughs> like I would drink on the way to the mall. Like, what the hell is with that? You know, <laughs> crazy, crazy. Wow. But yeah. but, but you yeah. did it. But you did it and you're doing it. Now, a lot of people in that situation, they will replace something for another. Did you dive headfirst into more drums or more exercise or cigarettes or any did you replace it with something i i did smoke i quit smoking uh at the same time i quit drinking for a little while and then i picked up smoking again um i quit smoking probably seven years after i quit drinking mm -hmm. um and then man i'm just full-on caffeine 
full on. I mean, Starbucks. It's like it's so weird because, you know, it's caffeine. So it's not the same, you know, obviously the same thing as like drinking. But like when I'm really stressed, I want a shot of espresso. It's a shot. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. like, so like I'll get like really stressed or, or, you know, bummed, whatever it is, some extreme emotion. And I'll be like, I'm going to Starbucks. I've got to get me, you know, a double shot, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's actually a really bad and expensive habit. Um, yeah, but coffee yeah. never killed anybody, isn't it? You're not going to get right. behind the wheel and go uh, like, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm not going to make, hopefully not going to make bad decisions when I'm all like wired up or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, well you, maybe I do. I take on too much. That's the one thing. <laughs> you've just overcome so much. I mean, that's it's it's incredible. You 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 turn tragedy into triumph, and so you're you're getting good at the drums. You're studying the drums a little bit. You you get over that hurdle. Uh, you're in your early twenties. What, what are you playing? Like Deep Ellum? They're you playing yep. Trees, Dada, original bands, all that kind yep. of stuff. All that stuff on the rocks, uh, the basement, Dallas City Limits, Smoke a Day's Rock Room. Uh, there was a rock garden. Um, just yeah, Dada. We did that. There was so many venues. I can't even remember them all right now. But yeah, I played Deep Ellum probably through maybe two thousand two or something like that. Kind of when it there was a shift. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and then I actually uh, got into an all girl band for a short period of time uh, called Baby Jane Hudson. And we were together like 2000 to 2004. And that was very different because honestly, my whole career, I've always played with guys. It just that's just how it's worked out. And I, I do need to give a shout out to the guys that I've played with because, you know, there could be s stereotypes around female drummers or female musicians or whatever. And uh, nobody that I've ever played with ever even considered that an issue. Like they never looked at that and thought, oh, we don't want a chick drummer or, uh, oh, she's not going to be good because she's a girl or whatever it is that they think. Uh, you know, I feel like I was afforded all the same opportunities as anybody else, uh, in some cases more, because I think people looked at it, you know, kind of like a like a like a cool little thing you know for their band hey we've got a chick drummer you know um so that, that was really cool but anyway so yeah i was yeah. in an all-girl band and we were doing all original music and to be honest i was doing original music from the beginning of my career 88 till probably about 2012 or so maybe and that's when i switched over into cover music yeah so um but yeah and that pays the bills a little cover music pays man you know it does yeah and you, get, does. you could do it until you drop um i got no problem with that well that's interesting because i was going to ask you i'm not going to be all like james brown it's like it's a man's i'm not going to be like it's a man's <laughs> world yeah, but yeah. it's it's a it's a very male dominated industry usually the the female in the band is singing that's right yep that's right but, but you feel like it was pretty a pretty smooth road everybody that yeah you know, yeah I mean, and um, for for me with other peers uh, now, like if I show up a, to a gig, I can't tell you, Rich, how many times I show up to a gig, dragging drums, and they're like, "Oh, that's so sweet, you're helping your boyfriend." I'm like, <laughs> "Oh man, I'm gonna give you black eye," you know? <laughs> These are my drums. <laughs> yeah, or like uh, just the other night, um, somebody walked up and they were like, "Oh, are you guys in the band?" And me and my singer, they were like, "Yeah." And, they're like, oh, well, what do you do? And he's like, I'm the singer. And they're like, oh, well, what do you do? And I was like, I'm the drummer. And they're like, oh my god! Like they just freak out because that's not what they're expecting. You're yeah. right. Now, did but, you look? Um, did you look to female drummers for inspiration? Say the Gina Shocks or the Sheila E's or the, um, what was it? Um, uh, yeah, you know, or was it? Uh, did it matter? It didn't matter. That's the thing. And I think, um, you know, I just, I just looked at all drummers the same way. I never. It didn't matter any walk of life, it, everybody was just a drummer. Like I've always yeah. been that way about everybody. Um, yeah. You know, my mom always thought that, you know, I, I could friend anybody or date anybody because like, I just had, you know, I just, I love everybody, you know, like, and so uh, I was really into, of course, you know, it was the eighties. So Neil Peart. So yeah, that was my guy. I had his posters all over the wall. Amazing. Um, yeah. That was a big one. Uh, John Bonham, definitely, um, you know, just, God, that guy's foot is awesome. Um, and then, but, you know, later down the line, I don't know if you knew of a band. Do you remember a band called uh, Sister Seven that was out of Austin? Yeah, they used to play Dada all the time. Yeah, Patrice Pike. Uh, Patrice, what up? She was a yeah, rock was a monster, star. man. Yeah. Um, so they had a drummer um, named Sean Phillips 
uh, back then. And that guy, he was, he's to this day, the biggest inspiration for me drumming wise. Um, and you can really tell, like I was in an original band called Frog Knot and then also in Baby Jane Hudson, I kind of took that style that Sean had and applied that to those songs. So it's kind of more of like a, fo- a funk, you know, rock groove kind of thing. Mm. Um, and I just, God, I love Sean Phillips playing and he, he doesn't play anymore. And, uh, well, and- so I was going to say, do you guys, are you friendly? Yeah, Is- yeah. And well, that's what I was going to say is like, you know, it's, it's so cool because with social media, you know, people are accessible now sure. and, and like, you know, we friended each other years ago and I, I say this at every interview when I'm talking about drumming, I talk about him and I was like, I should freaking tell him. You know, so how important, I how important he was to me. Yeah. 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 So I messaged him and, and, and thanked him for being such an inspiration and uh, actually sent him uh, some frog knot music. And he wrote back and said he thought it was really great and that he could hear the, his you know influence over me. And I was just like, oh, my God, you know, because that's great. Even though, even I remember though, I remember like seeing them play. Sometimes I would just be walking down Deep Elm and I'd get on my tippy toes and look through the window to see oh yeah yeah there's sister seven wow. they're great guy is so good like and it's just the thing with him is he's just so solid and you know he doesn't overplay uh but when he does those little fills in there they're just so unique and tasty it's just i i just could listen to him every day now why does he not play anymore what happened i don't i really don't know i don't know the story behind that he's in corporate america now so he's got a family i know <laughs> what's up with that, <laughs> is that but man? yeah the other guys are still playing a lot uh they're not a sister seven but patrice pike with wayne sutton and um i don't think that she has the same bass player anymore but she's still out there doing some things but it's not the same man i need sean there you know yeah. now is, is deep ellum still the 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 uh, we're place where new music is discovered. Is it still the hot spot to go on Friday and Saturday nights for the alternative crowd? You know, I am so disconnected from that anymore. Um, yeah. We have actually played a couple of times. Metal shops actually played like some um, private parties and stuff at trees and been down there a few times, but I really re- rarely get down there. You know, it, I, I, it kind of had, like I said, a shift a while back and it sort of started feeling dangerous, you know, like it wasn't really safe to be just kind of like walking around down there. And maybe it's better now. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm not in that scene, you know, at all since the cover scene. I mean, literally yeah. in the cover scene, there's no uh, venues in Dallas proper. You got to fly it's out. all around. It's, yeah, it's yeah. all around. It's like it's like Mansfield and Fort Worth and, gotcha. you know, Frisco and the Colony and Louisville and, you know, Rockwall. It's like all around Dallas, but it's not in Dallas. Yeah. So I don't really get a taste of that scene that much anymore, which is really weird for me because uh, that was everything I was in. You know, um, I meant to mention to you earlier because we're yeah. talking about um, original music that I actually do still do original music with one group called 49th Vibration. So I, I mean, I'm sure you understand this, like doing your own music and coming up with your own drum parts. There's just really nothing, nothing better than that. I know I have on my to-do list. To, I want to put out a, 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 a fun little Greg Bissonette style solo record where, nice. you know, one thing is kind of like a blood, sweat and tears thing. And another thing is kind of like a fun weather report thing. And then there's like a King's X thing and 12 different yeah. fun kind of tracks and no vocals, all instrumental. And kind of like a, you'd call it like, approachable fusion you know like not over the top fusion where you can't find one you can't clap right. your hands it's soccer mom fusion so i i have it on the to-do <laughs> list to come to to do my you know just for you gotta, me you gotta coin that phrase soccer, soccer mom, mom fusion. fusion yeah get shirts made i'll buy one that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> you know um uh, a band that I really loved, um, and my girlfriend, Kara, loves it also because we were in Dallas at the same time, but we didn't know each other in the 90s. Um, we really loved the Toadies. I loved that yeah. band. Yeah. Just, just knuckle-dragging gutter rock. Yeah, totally. Just- and they've got another group going now. I forget. It's a couple of the members. Uh, the female bass player uh, from the Toadies uh, is in it. And I don't know if you do this, but she's a breast cancer survivor also. Oh, okay. She was diagnosed, yeah, just a few years ago. She's doing good. But uh, I wish I could remember the band because um, I was playing with another original band not too long ago called Bullet, and we played with them. So, yeah, I mean, just great, great musicianship. And, yeah, Toadies were cool. There was so much cool stuff back then. Um, Billy Goat, you remember them? Oh, my God, I love Billy yeah. Goat with, uh, with Earl Harvin. And Earl oh. moved to, like, I think Sweden, Stockholm or something. You know, that we guy. thought hey, he just he just left the United States. I was yeah. weird. Yeah, um, that guy is amazing. Yeah. 
Billy Goat was a heck. It was very percussion driven. Yeah, yeah, Mike, totally. Mike, Mike Dillon, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, because so he cool. and, and they had a band called Ten Hands that was like yep. very popular mm -hmm. in the Denton area, and I had all their CDs, and I would like transcribe all of Earl's parts like, <laughs> like a total nerd. Um, so, awesome. so what? What's next? I know that you have a big vision where breast cancer can stick it. Um, it the foundation you want it to grow and grow and grow and grow, yes. and so. I believe one of your goals is to have a brick and mortar location and a staff, a paid staff. Yes. So yes. How, do you, how, how do you, how do we do that? How do you get there? Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is breast cancer can stick it is such an amazing business model. I mean, for us to raise $600,000 without any staff is just, I mean, it's crazy. And if you think about, thank you. If you think about, you know, if we had people doing this uh, 24, you know, well, not 24, seven, Five days a week, you know, um, and, nine to five, and, yeah, to five. 40 hours a week and everything like that. Um, even three people, Rich, uh, I can't even imagine what kind of an impact we could make. I mean, we would easily, you know, double, triple our numbers. I mean, it's just, you know, we could have such a, a bigger impact. I know that, you know, people may look at that like, hey, you know, less overhead and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's kind of almost like an investment. It's like we get more staff members, we're able to raise even more money and have even a bigger impact. And that's really what I want. You know, I, I want, you know, breast cancer can to be a, a thing of the past. You know, I, I want to save more lives. And, you know, we're having an impact today just through what we're doing. And, and I just figure, you know, we could have an even bigger impact. And so what we're looking at right now, Rich, is we're wanting to get grants. So we want to get uh, some grants to kind of kickstart that. Um, we have some people, as you said, within breast cancer can stick it just amazing people like super talented uh marketing prowess type of people um that just know exactly what to do and if they had the time it'd be nuts and there is like all these people are like four three or four ladies on our board they're like just tell me when you know tell me when we're jumping off and we're going to do this and i'm there you know, and they got their big jobs and everything else, but they're they're ready for it. So yeah, awesome. to get to get grants like an, an investment essentially, uh, where you know we could really smack at it for a year or two and just show what can be done. Uh, that's really my goal. And fortunately, I uh, recently um, met a drummer who has a lot of experience in grants, and so I'm starting to work with him to get those things lined up. We also have a partner with Parkland who has a lot of connections that way, and she's going to be uh, helping us find you know, proper grants to submit to, to apply for and things, and so that's really the route we're headed down right now, but if the book just like blows up or something, then I'll be like, you know, that investor to, you know, throw that in there, so it's, it's sort of like, I, you know, the you know how it is uh, making a book explode that's it's like yeah. charting an album by yourself or something you just yeah. can't it's it's very difficult but you know wh whatever way it happens i i feel like we're really truly on the cusp of something absolutely amazing and not only just you know making a difference through uh funding these programs but just bringing positivity and hope to people out there that are going through it doesn't even have to be breast cancer just some kind of challenge or despair, you know, just bringing that positivity out to, to the world, you know. That's the thing is that you're a model uh, for people to overcome. Well, thanks. Man. So you Thank have you. a, yeah, I mean, you have a purpose and you got sidetracked and you said enough, I will beat this. And then you get back to your purpose. And then the same time you discover another purpose, which is to help as many people as humanly possible. What, um, in learning about your body and cancer and health and prevention and follow-up exams and all that kind of stuff, what can women do to prevent this from happening in the first place? And what can they do to make sure that they catch it in time? Right, right. I'm super glad you're asking this question. It's like, I, it's almost like if I could feed you the questions, you're just like, you just know them. That's, Perfect, man. Um, <laughs> no, because this is like really important to me because people don't recognize what they can do. So the first thing you want to do is know your risk. Um, so American Cancer Society, 
great website. You can look up breast cancer risk. It'll tell you the things uh, to know about. So as you get older, your uh, risk of any kind of cancer goes up. Um, it's one out of every three women will get some kind of cancer in their life. One out of every two men will get some kind of cancer in their life. Jeez. One out of every eight women will get breast cancer. Um, and two of the things that we can do to lower our risk um, are, and nobody likes them, but uh, less alcohol. Uh, alcohol damages cells. Uh, Dr. O'Shaughnessy can go on and on about it. I've got lots of uh, things up on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash breast cancer can stick because the it just was too long for them. Um, and so uh, you can go there and, and watch a lot of videos where she goes into to detail about you should have you know maximum three drinks a week and not all at the same time. I mean, it's that sensitive. Wow. Um, and then the other is um, exercise and, and nutrition. You know, um, They're finding uh, a direct correlation between obesity and cancer. Sure. Um, and so the one thing that I think is really cool is Dr. O'Shaughnessy talks about how she's, you know, tried working with women, for example, to uh, help them lose weight. And it's just really hard because a lot of men, women get breast cancer when they're in menopause, which slows down your metabolism. And so everything's kind of fighting against you. And then if you go through breast cancer, then, you know, you're tired and you're exhausted. So you're not as active. So it's just like, it's fighting against uh, against yeah, you. Yeah. And so um, she is a, a big proponent, which she's not really into just throwing medication at things. I, I need to tell you that. Like when I first finished treatment, she's like, what are you on? And I told her, she's like, when I get you off this, when I get you off this, like she doesn't want people on a bunch of medication, but she really thinks that those weight loss shots are possibly going to be an answer to help reduce uh, the risk of breast cancer in a lot of women. And she's going to be doing, I think you heard it when she spoke about it at the VIP party, she's going to be doing some some tests and trials to try to prove that theory. If they start giving women um, the weight loss shot, if it, you know, reduces these cells that are, that are causing the problem. And that's interesting uh, because because yeah. we we're having an exempic um, pandemic uh, not a pandemic. It's an epidemic of Ozempic um, in the sense that it's kind of being overused. And are we going to really know? Because you can lose right. muscle mass, you can lose bone density. And I'm thin and I'm skinny and I'm pretty. But it's like, is it going to stay that way? And have I right. really... It's I mean, you're probably like me. Like you look at something like that and you're like, oh, that can't be good for you. Like that's how... That's what yeah. I thought out of the gates. I'm like, you know, the easy answer is never the best one. That's what, what I always think. Um, but, you know, to have the sign off from Dr. O means something to me. Yeah, um, sure. You know, uh, so, you know, you're right. There's there's still things to learn about it. Um, but those are the the two, you know, big things. So nutrition, exercise, and uh, alcohol. So I kind of put exercise and nutrition together. Low-fat diet is great. She says if you've had breast cancer b before, keeping to a low-fat diet trying to keep to your, uh, your a good body weight, um, all that stuff is good. She said even like a 10% uh, weight increase after you've had uh, breast cancer can increase your risk of breast cancer by like 50%. I mean, it's like, it's crazy yeah. how important all that stuff is. But earlier I was also talking about, you know, knowing your risk. And so as women, uh, some of the risk factors are, like I said, getting older. If you've never had children, I've never had children before. Um, I didn't know that was a, a risk factor. Not that it would have changed anything, but uh, it's just good to know. Um, you know, if you have cancer in your family, obviously, uh, which when I was diagnosed, I was like, oh, I just have this one person on my mom's side and these couple people on my dad's. I was like, that's not really anything. But when I did the genetic testing, they had me do something. I think it's called like a genogram where you put like your family tree and then you put any anybody who had cancer you write on it. So we did all this research and found wow. it was just all this cancer on my dad's side. Oh wow. And so it we're pretty confident that that breast cancer came from my my dad's side. However, um none of the genes I've been tested for have been linked back to breast cancer, so um they haven't found the gene yet that does that. But so genetic testing, I'm a big proponent of that. If you've had um if you had any kind of cancer before, getting the genetic testing is super important for your family. Uh, I think it's a really good thing to do, but yeah, I mean, to me, that's a pretty good toolkit. I don't know. Yeah, genetic testing. I, I, uh, I. That's something that I want to put on the to do to do list, and perhaps the um, they can do full body scans now. Not, it's weird. It's like under the radar. A lot of people don't know about it. I don't know if any insurance companies really cover it, but 
someone told me you can get a full body scan and it'll it'll outlet like you could see what's happening in your body oh what is this what is this yeah, what, yeah. you know what i mean might as well There's do it I, I did a thing because, you know, gosh, after having breast cancer, you know, you just kind of go through phases where you're like, oh, man, I just, you know, I'm not going to oncologist anymore. And I'm just kind of freaked out. I just want to kind of get a clean bill of health kind of thing. And so I went to a company called Viascan um, here in Dallas, and um, they did like a body scan. And then, you know, inevitably, just so you know, like everybody has like cysts. You, almost everybody has cysts of some kind but you know there were some that they wanted me to chase down and make sure of course everything turned out great but yeah and that wasn't covered by insurance but it was it wasn't so outlandish that you couldn't afford it either um but yeah i mean doesn't it just kind of makes you want to do that doesn't it it's like i just want to i just want to know <laughs> you know yeah oh man it's yeah. uh it's yeah definitely empowering yourself um, to either prevent or uh, prevent it from happening again. You right. Know? Yeah. 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 I had a I had a male drum teacher in uh, El Paso, Texas, growing up, who got breast cancer, as it happens in men too. So. Yeah. Well, did you know uh, Peter Chris from Kiss had breast cancer? I did not know that. Wow. Yeah. 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 He did. Uh, have you Have and, you met him? Have you talked to him about it? No, I haven't. I've I've talked to people in his circle about it but haven't been able to get him because i would really love to have him at a drumathon i think it would be super fitting incredible to have him. yeah and we have a survivors group on facebook called uh, survivors rock a breast cancer can stick it community and we have a male breast cancer survivor in that group who's a police officer wow. and uh so it's really cool i've done some interviews with him it's it's interesting to hear their side of course the likelihood of a of a man getting breast cancer is super low but i mean just like everybody says, you find anything that's not normal, you got to go get it checked out. I mean, and, you know, people who are like, uh, I'm afraid to go get it checked out. It's like, dude, trust me, you should be more afraid to not get it checked out. You know, that is profound. Yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah but a lot of people don't like going to the doctor and stuff. It's like, look, it, just do it and just do yeah. it. Just do it consistently. You know, for, for many years, my dad would not go to the dentist. And I was like, dad, what are you British? Come on here. <laughs> uh, he, he, awesome. he finally went and I was like, this is much better, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, much, much better. Well, um, what am I forgetting? I'm trying to do my best Mario Lopez here. You're great, Mario. Um, I guess the one thing I'll say, you were kind of talking about like the future of things and Yeah, yeah. Um an another thing that that like I have another dream is, you know, we have Drumathon every year here, but I have this Oh, you want to take like, it on the road. I do. I want to do the Drumathon like summer tour or something, like big time, man. I really want to do that, hit all the big markets, uh, you know reach all the folks in in those different cities and states that aren't familiar with breast cancer can stick it and and just the i don't know the 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 hope and positivity and and joy being a part of breast cancer can stick it can bring to your life i mean mm -hmm. i just really want to bring that to people and the awareness of course you know fundraising the whole package i mean there's just so much with breast cancer can stick it that you can get out of it whether it's helping you to know when to go to the doctor or bringing some new friends in your life you know it's it's just a it's just a really great package that i really want to take around to i can to see that hey if there's any grant writers out there people who are connected who can get government grants i think that it would be a result of getting the grant because you know that the budget's going to go up but you could probably get a skeleton crew together like okay these oh, yeah. people are going to fly we need hotels got to have relationships with back backline companies so yep. not many you know because if you get a semi truck that would be great because you gotta have a driver and then yeah. all the gear is there but then maybe it's more cost effective to just get backline in each yeah, city yeah we just have to there's get some like some kind of those those uh wraps that you put on that make them pink <laughs> yeah yeah i mean there's 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 definitely a way to do it um yeah, and yeah. i can i can definitely see that happening no problem of obviously there's anything that I could do. I mean, I'm just thrilled to be in your orbit. I'm thrilled to know you. I'm thrilled to know your story. And I'm thrilled to be part of Breast Cancer Can Stick It from time and, to time. Dude, thank you so much. And I, I'm sure I've told you this before. Uh, you know, I met you and Mark Schulman on the NAM floor 2013 in the <laughs> Sabian booth. And from the moment I met you guys, I was like, I want to be like those guys. Oh, like I like like you guys are just big mentors to me. It's not just about your fantastic drumming. It's just about you as people um, that you guys, 
you're not just sitting around and just playing drums. You're you're doing motivational speaking. You're you're releasing books. You're 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 reaching people. And uh, just thank you for being such a mentor to me and oh and for God. everything you've done for breast cancer can stick it and still do. It's just I can't even. I don't even know how to thank you, man. Well, I just, just got a bunch so of goosebumps all up and down my body. And uh, it's really, it's uh, that that I'm sure the pleasure is ours. And you know, the funny thing is, is I'm thinking about your future growing breast cancer can stick it um, as a foundation and an event. Um, you're going to speak. You're already doing it. You know what I mean? And now you're just, now you have a platform with this book. It's going to be a bestseller on Amazon. And then you're going to start doing keynote speeches and what's great about doing keynote speeches is even if you have drumming related injuries or you get carpal tunnel right as long as you got the gift of gab which is what (laughs) you you have it you can go and 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 impact people yeah yeah and i would love i would love to do that i've done some speaking engagements haven't done them in a hot minute uh, do some like lunch and learns with businesses around town through That's Zoom. Great. Got something coming up, I think, possibly with a soft drink company this year. Lunch so yeah, learn. I mean, I'm I'm trying to step into that realm, Rich. I'll be calling you. Hey, man, what do I do? Oh, I love it. <laughs> well, yeah, you should, man, yeah. No, it's anytime. And you know what? We're talking about making friends and relationships and lifelong friends. I gotta I gotta give it up for Sean Messick, man. You 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 said, hey, you know babysit this guy for two days <laughs> and 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 he did man and we really got to know each other and he's just wow what a great guy such a blessing man he he came in uh 2014 uh we were doing a fundraiser in corpus christi with aj Perro from twisted sister oh god rest his soul man yeah jimmy deanna from bullet boys and troy laquetta from tesla we love and troy. um he was uh he came to help tech so he and another friend of mine, we had a mutual friend, and and he brought Sean. And ever since that moment, man, Sean and I've been locked in. He's been a part of Breast Cancer Can Stick It since that since that meeting, and just such a such a blessing. And um, just I mean, talk about positivity and encouragement. That guy brings amazing. It. Sean, yeah. Sean, we're talking about you, man. And and <laughs> and he heard in my little clinic that I did over at Dallas Percussion that I have a love affair with octopuses right now or octopi. Oh. And, and I just think that they're the most incredible freaking gift from God creatures. They're just they're undeniably special creatures. And he bought me an octopus shirt. Oh, that's excellent. That's awesome. It, it came in the it was an octopus. It's an octopus playing the drums, which is Oh, that's even better. It's like cra- it's like totally crazy. So awesome. um so usually I think this is a good way to end this. We talk about the the Fave Five. What's your favorite color? Favorite color? Well, hot pink now. Oh, come on. It was perfect. And how often do you get to get that hair colored? Uh, every six weeks. That's oh my god! I color my hair more than you do. <laughs> I just got this this color today. I won't even tell you what it cost. Ouch! Nice coat of paint. Oh my god! How about um, a favorite food or a dish? I love Mexican food. Love it. Tex Mex all the way. You're in the right city for that. Yes, absolutely. That's what I actually told. I told Sean. I said, "Hey, can you take me to a Taco Cabana? I like it. I know it's fast, but no, it, I dig it too. It's I like good. it. I like yeah, it a lot. What about your favorite drink? Favorite drink is a, it's a, what is it called now? They keep changing the name of it. It's a iced espresso uh, from, from Starbucks, uh, of course. Starbucks. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Kenny D loves you. you now, Kenny D owns a large portion of Starbucks. So, oh, really? He loves, he's thanking you for your business. Now, this one is <laughs> tough. This is the kind of thing where, whether it's the artist or the melody or just the drum beat, you don't know why, but, this song just haunts you in your life. And when it comes on the radio, you're going to crank it up. What's what would be your favorite song? Are you with me now by 6 a.m.? Oh, okay. but uh, Nikki Six. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, oddly, James Michael, he played drums on that. He's a singer and he played drums on those albums, those early albums. And it's so good. I just love it. Um, I, I, I don't know why, but. I figured that's the song that came to my head. I'm going to say it. I know it's one of my favorites. Um, one more time. What's the title? What's the title? It's called Are You With Me uh, by 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Yeah, nice. yeah. Big fan of 6 a.m. music. Um, I'm always also uh, feeling that way by Journey is another one. So Feeling that. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. And then what would be your favorite movie? 
Favorite movie? Oh my gosh. I don't know. Um, best in show, probably. That's maybe, so good. Maybe Airplane. I know it's... <laughs> My parents, man, I can't believe they let us watch that in 1977. I mean, none of this would fly anymore. Oh, I speak no. jive. Uh, no, uh, I know. I know. What? It's, it's red, amazing. It's red and white. It looks like a big Tylenol. <laughs> I mean, there's just so many great quotes in that stupid movie. It's 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 terrible, but I mean, it's the quotes, you know. And I love Best in Show because what is it? It's uh, Thanksgiving every day. The Best in Show is on. On Thanksgiving Day, the Best in Show is on after the Macy's Day Parade. Mm -hmm. And I am a sucker. I'm not really a, you know, I might get some hate mail for this. I'm more of a cat person than I am a dog person because uh -huh. I can't walk a dog three times a day. <laughs> but a cat, I can leave for a week. Right, right. Just you know throw some I mean? food out there and they're good to go. Yeah. yeah that's crazy. Um <laughs> Well, this has been so much fun, and I think the book is great. Ladies and gentlemen, the book is called Breast Cancer Can Stick It. You can get it at jeffbezos.com, amazon.com, the same company that will deliver your toilet paper and everything that is so convenient. <laughs> Pick up the book. There it is. It's an incredible read. I read it cover to cover as soon as I got it. It's very, very inspiring. Uh, breastcancercanstickit.org, aprilsamuels.com. April, thank you so much. It's always great to see you. Thank you so much, Rich, for having me, and thanks again for all you do for Breast Cancer Can Stick It, man. I, oh, hey, maybe we'll see you in October. Uh, it's, uh -huh. it's a great thing. Yes. One more time. What is happening in October? Where, when, and time? Drumathon, October 20th, 12 to 7, Grandscape, the Colony, Texas. Drumathon. Come That's out. it. That's April Samuels. We love her. And to all the people that are watching the show, listening to the show, we really appreciate it. Be sure to subscribe. There's a new episode that drops every Friday, 52 episodes this year. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Helps people find the show. We really appreciate it. April, thanks so much. Thank you, man. It's good to see you. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.